But now to our closing keynote. Um, as with our opening session, we really wanted, or we were looking for a speaker who could, uh, who could touch upon a variety of aspects of the entertainment is industry at large and the children's entertainment industry in particular. Caroline Barron has an impressive resume. She's an award-winning producer of a critically, critically acclaimed feature film such as Monsoon, Wedding and Capote. But she's also the founder of Filmmade International, a humanitarian organization that uses film and media in general to educate and entertain displaced people around the world. And most recently, she's the co-founder of Yamiko, a new media company that is developing entertaining and educational content for children on a variety of platforms. We're extremely happy that, and honored to have Caroline here with us today, and I'm excited that she also brought her entire family. So um, with that, Caroline, please come on on stage. Thank you, Krista. Hi, everybody. Um, it's really nice to be here, especially to be at the Kids Film Festival. I've been at the, uh, the Grown Up Festival, um, but never in this building, which is so incredible. Um, I love Toronto. How many of you are from Toronto? Most of you. Uh, I made uh, three films in Canada. Um, Capote in Winnipeg. Um, Indian Summer up in Algonquin, Algonquin Park. And uh, The Santa Claus, the first one here in Toronto. And actually, um, Monsoon Wedding, which was not made in, in Toronto, obviously, um, was supposed to premiere here on September 11th, 2001. So as you can imagine, it was, um, it was hard to be away from New York City, and I lived downtown at that time. But I will always remember how incredible the people of Toronto were when we were um, trying to get out and go back home. So it's great to be back, and I'm honored to be invited to speak to you guys today. So I'm curious to know who's in the room. How many of you are producers? Not too many. Uh, any directors? Content creators? Who are you guys? <laughs> Moviegoers? <laughs> Programmers. Programmers. Anything else? Did I miss something? Researchers. Researchers? Awesome. Um, so as you can see from my these, some of these movies, my career um, did not start in children's media. Um, but recently, since I've been a mom of two amazing boys. You want to stand up, guys? Say hi. Um, and I've watched, that's Asher and Emmanuel. And I've watched how much, how much media impacts their lives. Um, I started to focus my attention more on, on children's content. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so my kids are, are mildly addicted to their devices and my devices, and Anthony's device, my husband is right there. Um, and we're all very tethered to these devices and communicating with each other more and more through social media. And our kids are gaming all the time and playing with apps and even at the most tender ages. I'm always amazed on the subway in New York when I see like a, a kid who could barely even hold anything holding her mom's phone. But rather than mourn the loss of a sort of simpler, less connected time, I really am excited about what's happening um, with technology and the opportunity it's offering to a whole world of filmmakers who have limitless reach. And regardless of the platform, whether it's a TV show or a webisode or an episode or a video or a TV show or a video game, whatever it is, it's all about storytelling. And in the words of Asher, because of new technology, we can create things we couldn't do before, which is pretty amazing given that he's only 10. So, <laughs> um, and it's always excited me to imagine using media to change behavior and have a positive impact on the world. And I, when I was a very young child, I was um, sort of brought up to think about doing good. And as a Jewish person, uh, the concept of tikkun olam, I don't know how many of you have heard of that expression, but it means to repair the world. And I was brought up believing that was an integral part of what it was to be alive. And I always wanted to figure out ways of, of helping. But somehow I became a filmmaker. I was very, very lucky. My brother was at a party when I 
right after I graduated from college and he met somebody who was working on a movie who was looking for people to help on the movie. And I ended up getting a job for, for working for free on a very, very, you know, I just, it was a pretty impressive film, I have to say. How do I make this go? Just press like that? That was it. <laughs> have, who has seen it? Uh, it became a cult classic. Um, I started out as the as a PA working for free. Then I was the costume designer. Um, I was told to go out and buy a hat for the, the the main actor, and I said, "Okay, how much money can I spend?" And they said nothing. Um, and I came back practically crying because I had spent two dollars at the Salvation Army, and I said, "I'll pay for it myself." Um, and then I became the production manager, really because I was the only person that was still breathing and. Uh, uh, <laughs> From there, I, um, it stuck. I loved making movies, I loved production, and I just kept working on films. And I would go from film to film, and I moved out to LA, and I was meeting a lot of people from other countries. And I got very excited about what their lives were like and where they were from, and I had a real travel bug. So I went from movie to Russia, movie to Czechoslovakia, movie to Southeast Asia. And I just started to travel a lot all through film people and meeting people that I, um, I realized that I had a common language with. And some of those experiences were actually very, very profound, like being in the former Soviet Union and the, what the, what's now the Czech Republic before the fall of communism and actually during the fall of communism. Um, and I was exposed to poverty and injustice and human rights abuses that I had not experienced before. And I really wanted to figure out a way that I could do something that would be of service. Um, but I didn't think that I could because I was making really classy movies. <laughs> um, and then in 1999, I heard a report on the radio that there was a war in Kosovo and refugees were fleeing Kosovo um, by the thousands. And I was listening to NPR in, in, our, in New York, and I heard the journalist talking about life in a refugee camp and how unrelenting boredom, hopelessness, psychological trauma. And I had worked on a Preston Sturgis film that I co-produced, and I remembered um, a line from one of the movies. Maybe we could play that first clip. Sorry to disappoint you. Yes, and I say it with some embarrassment, but I don't want to make old brother where art thou. You don't want to make old brother where art thou? No, and I say it with some embarrassment. I want to make a comedy. You say it with some embarrassment? He doesn't want to make a brother where art thou, he wants to make a comedy. He don't mean that, boss. He's still a little stir-crazy. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, no, I'm not. You're joking, aren't you, Sully? It's in bad taste, but it's a joke. No. But it's had more publicity than the Johnstown flood. What are we going to do with all that publicity? Oh, brother. Why don't you want to make old brother where art thou, Sully? Well, in the first place, I'm too happy to make old brother where art thou. In the second place, I haven't suffered enough to make old brother where art thou. You haven't suffered enough. He hasn't suffered enough. No. But, Sully... I'll tell you something else. There's a lot to be said for making people laugh. Did you know that's all some people have? It isn't much, but it's better than nothing in this cockeyed caravan. <laughs> so I thought about that movie. And I thought about that line. And I called a good friend of mine who was a filmmaker from Bosnia. And I said, it was a Sunday morning, I was in bed. I was like, I just, I got to help these refugees. <laughs> and I said, Adamir, what if, um, what if we brought movies to the refugees? What if we set up screenings for the kids? And he said, that's a great idea. And when we were in Sarajevo and the city was under siege, we held a film festival and people ran to the theater at risk of being killed by sniper fire just to get something to feed them. And I had just worked with Jane Rosenthal and Robert De Niro, so I thought they're pretty influential people. <laughs> so I called Jane and she said, that's a really great idea, I'll call Bob. And next thing I knew, this thing started to spiral and I found myself six weeks later partnering with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Didn't know who they were when I first started this whole thing. Um, and I was in Macedonia, and I hired a local crew, again, the filmmakers from around the world. I had a friend that was, knew some people in Macedonia, and we started showing movies. 
And we started showing entertaining films. And I realized immediately that we were gathering thousands of people to come to these outdoor screenings and that we could use the screens also to provide information. UNICEF was passing out a landmine awareness brochure. We videotaped it and then projected it and reached so many more people that way. And FilmAid was born. And we kept working throughout that entire refugee crisis. And the UN High Commissioner for Refugees said, can you please bring this to Africa? I was like, I'm not an aid worker. This is crazy. And she said, I need, there have been refugees in camps for decades. And Film Aid started in Africa in 2001. And actually, this, is, this week is our 15th anniversary of when I had the idea for Film Aid. Um, and why don't we just show a little bit about what Film Aid is? have seen a struggle of life and death happening all throughout the day. They've walked for days to get here. International aid organizations here are meeting the needs of the people by providing them with health services and sanitation and shelter and food. But why film? Because the film I made about cholera prevention helped save the lives of people in the community. Why film? Because my friend had killed herself after she was raped. After screening our film on sexual violence, girls came to me to ask for help. If my friend had seen this film, she might be alive. But why film? Because film brings us laughter and hope when before we had nothing but violence and fear. So, why film? Why film? Why film? Because the power of film educates and informs. Because the power of film brings laughter and joy and provides psychological relief. Because the power of film helps to save lives. So filming clearly has grown a lot since those early days in Macedonia. I think we'll move off the Toxic Avenger. <laughs> um, and it's still amazing to me. I was in Afghanistan in 2002, and I showed The Wizard of Oz to girls, and to orphans, basically. And the girls didn't think they'd even be invited to the, the to the screening. They had never heard music before. Um, it was prohibited under the Taliban. They had never seen a photograph of a woman before. So you can imagine how what we do as programmers, as producers, directors, it's powerful. Um, and as idealistic as it may sound, I really believe that that power can change the world. And that art, like in movies, music, transcends politics and it unites people. Through my work with filmmakers, I've obviously seen this over and over again, but as a parent, and seeing the enormous impact of media on my kids, I realized that we as content creators are in a unique position to meet kids where they are. So while raising them, these children, in this very rapidly changing digital world, um, I'm just gonna move on to more film aid. Um, as complicated as those issues are of screen time, I'm excited by the opportunity of the devices and the opportunity for innovation, creativity, curiosity, compassion, and perseverance. When our older son, Asher, was in preschool, he had a best friend who is still his best friend. And as it turns out, Asher's best friend, Oliver's mother, created Blue's Clues. You guys have heard of Blue's Clues? So we're shifting from the uh, <laughs> sublime to the more sublime. Um, and I realized that I hadn't heard of Blue's Clues at the time, but that she was obviously very, very talented. And so 
Tracy and her husband, Bob, and my husband and I got together and realized that we had a lot of complementary skills and that perhaps we could create some really great content for kids. And Yummy Co. was born. It's a company that is dedicated to creating content that is good and good for you, delicious media. And we really felt that, you know, with, this, with new technology, we could possibly change the paradigm and instead of the old way of doing things and working for studios and you know, creating great content for other people to be in charge of, to make money from, that we could actually maybe create our own content and own it. And we felt like as parents, we really knew what the issues were that we were dealing with and that we could actually create content that we could use in our own lives. So the first property that we um, came up with was Yummy Lou. And we released an app a year ago called Yummy Lou Rainbow Power. And this property is all about getting kids to eat healthy food. Let's show that clip, please. Yummy! Daniel wants you to know that his hand, it was his finger that was pointing to everything. Um, so our strategy with Yummy Co. is to enter the market with digital properties first. So as you saw, that was an app. Um, from there, we deepen engagement, ideally, by creating more apps um, and partnering with more traditional distribution partners, because obviously distribution is the key, right? How do we get people to really pay attention to our content? How do we rise above the noise? Um, in this case, with Yummy Lou, we've partnered with WNET in New York to create a public media site. Um, but to give you a little example of, and we all obviously also, we are hoping that we will eventually go to television series and sell toys <laughs> and properties and products. Um, so, as an example of taking the content that we, cr that we created for that game and sort of re reconfiguring it, I'll show you another clip based on the same property that's for slightly older kids. Go pear, go pear. Orange and yellow foods 
are yummy. Come on, Rudy, just shake it. Yeah. Yeah. Yummy. Yum. Don't make healthy choices, right? Yeah. When you have snack time. Yeah. 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 Don't make healthy choices, right? When you have snack time. trippier than the first. Um, so this is the, the world of Yummy Lou. And as I said, we are, we are partnering with WNET. Um, the app has gotten really well received. It's really well received, which is nice. Uh, we've had 100,000 downloads, and most of them are free. Um, and so with NET, we're doing a website. We're going to do parent and teacher kits, educational materials, games, interstitials, music videos. And we are also talking now about partnering with other countries to do um, a television series in France and maybe in the UK. The next property that we have launched just about a week ago is called The Adventures of Ash and Ollie. Ash, my son. And Ollie is Tracy and Bob's son, but it's really about Emmanuel. It's about two brothers and all the issues that parents and kids are dealing with today. And the first one is screen time. How many of you have kids? How many of them are addicted to devices? <laughs> or interested in devices? <laughs> OK, let's, um, let's watch the, uh, the screen time clip. screen time. Um, and we are currently in production on a really exciting project with DHX here in Canada and Sprout, which is all about creative problem solving. And it's a, a, a series that will be called Edison, the Invention Detective. Um, and it's about harnessing the, the, uh, the inspirational power of the maker movement and just how kids love to invent things. And I'll just show a clip of that. Then 
Captain Detective in the case of the missing birthday ball. Hi, thinkers. I'm Edison. Welcome to my workshop. Did you all meet Gyro? And this is Eureka. Greetings. Do you like snacks? Me too. So I invented the Automatic Action Snack Dispenser. So cool, so cool. I swing the boot, it kicks the ball down the hill. Watch this. Catapulting coils! It works! You see, I'm an inventor. I make things. That's Alex. It's his birthday today. We have a special birthday surprise for him. And Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Thanks, I guess. You don't look so good. My birthday party is ruined! Why do you think your party is ruined? It's a soccer party, but the soccer ball has disappeared. This is a terrible problem. What can I do? What can I do? Take a deep breath, Alex. Of course it's a problem, but you know what I always say. A pound's not a problem, not for me. I could solve anything. One, two, three, one. Explore. Take it through. Three. Try it out. Explore. Think. Try it out. A pound's not a problem, not for me. A pound's just a child and a mystery. We're on the case. Okay, let's explore the problem. Where did you last see your ball? In the park, where the party is going to be. I dare you to stop singing that song. <laughs> and I won't say the name of the other song that's in everybody's minds in, where I lived that was in that movie that's about cold things. Um, so, you know, going back to the power of media and innovation and creativity and invention and, um, and entrepreneurism, uh, I thought I would just share with you a story of my own my own life. Um, so Asher and Emmanuel are obviously very interested in, in technology and media. Um, and Asher was particularly inspired um, by a, a computer class that he took where he learned about 3D printing. And they learned um, how to make things. And they made about, this is about a year and a half ago, two years ago, they made menorahs. Um, you know what a menorah is, everybody? Um, so we were driving to Florida about a year and a half ago, and I, the kids were talking in the back seat a lot, and I was trying to get them to stop talking so much. They were having a big fight. And so I said, guys, did you know that next year, Hanukkah and Thanksgiving are going to be on the same day? And Asher said, gee, we should make menorahs in the shape of turkeys. I'm like, that's a brilliant idea. I said, what would you call it? And he said, the Minerki. Oh so we thought, Anthony and I were like, we, we, we have to actually do this. So we said, Asher, can you design it? And yes, he could. So he went on to his computer to Tinkercad, and he designed it. And... Then we thought, well, gee, how are we going to actually make these things? And how are we going to afford to make these things? And Asher um, insisted that we do a Kickstarter campaign, which we were sort of hesitant to do. And Anthony, who's very tech savvy as well, agreed, finally, relented. And let's just show this little clip. Designed by Asher. Hi, I'm Anthony Weintraub. Did you know that for the first time ever, and never again in our lifetime, 
that Hanukkah and Thanksgiving will overlap this year, we're excited to bring you a Kickstarter that celebrates this convergence of two of our most beloved holidays. But first, a word from our designer. My name is Asher Weintraub. I am nine years old and I'm entering the fourth grade in the fall. I like to design and invent things. Last winter, my mom told me that Hanukkah and Thanksgiving are going to be on the same day this year. It was the first time ever and might be the only time ever again. That got me thinking, what if there was a menorah in the shape of a turkey? That's when I had the idea for the Minerkey. A menorah in the shape of a turkey to celebrate a one-time event in history, the coming together of two of my favorite holidays. When you think about it, Thanksgiving and Hanukkah are sort of related. They're both holidays when we spend our time with families and are thankful for all that we have been given. What's a better way to celebrate that than a menorah shaped like a turkey? I love to do 3D printing and to make stuff in 3D. I use Tinkercad, a web-based modeling program. I thought we might be able to make the prototype this way. And with the help of our friends at MakerBot, we were able to print out a couple of models. That's where you come in. The big event is on November 28th. We have a logo, a trademark, a web address, and a prototype. And we've made some great connections with artisans and manufacturers as well as product people to get the Minerki out into the world. We need your help to start production and to do things like marketing, packaging, and shipping. Thanks for watching, and happy Thanksgiving. Please support our project. Thank you. So you can see why I'm inspired by uh, digital technology. Um, that was a photograph that was in the New York Times. Um, and the thing kind of went viral. It was uh, a $25,000 um, re request, and they raised almost double that. And we ended up at the White House. <laughs> um, so these are, these are inspirations from uh, the Minerki. There's a photo montage on Flickr. There's somebody who you know, took it all over Philadelphia, um, Instagram. And it was the biggest, part of the biggest day on Instagram ever, just the Minerki images. Um, so clearly, this is all a testament to the amazing reach of media today, as much as it is about how wonderful our kids are. But it's also about this incredible world that we're living in. Um, that an idea from a 10-year-old could be so viral, go so viral. So there's no denying the power of media, the power to transcend political and cultural barriers, to teach, to entertain, to evoke emotion, to inspire. We have limitless outlets for self-expression, creativity, and communication. And these are really, really exciting times. And I feel very, very fortunate to be a part of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was amazing. Yeah. And uh, our son, my son, is 21 months old now, and he has a goal to work towards. To uh, when he's 10 years old, he really has to come up with something very special. And <laughs> I'll teach him. Okay. Um, actually, I have a couple of questions, but I want to see if there are any questions in the audience already, because um, we're running short on time, and I don't want to give anything away. So, if not, I'll start. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, you, you started out as, uh, out as a film producer. You are still producing films, but you're really intrigued by digital media. And when it comes especially to creating content for children, um, how, what kind of uh, an advantage do digital media have when it comes to children's entertainment content over film or traditional well, media? Well, I think it's all, it's all the same. Yeah. You know, it really is. It's just that, that, that the way that we are making and consuming film content has changed so dramatically and it keeps changing and the ground is shifting under the traditional models you know the studios are clamoring to figure out how how to reach audiences they're really not making um they're not making the kinds of films that that we used to make like capote and monsoon wedding those films aren't really being made right, right now they're either very 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 low budgets or the big tentpole movies um, but i'm still very much um working on features as well but i'm excited by by kids' content, and I'm excited by the the multi-platform, transmedia, whatever you want to call it, aspect of our lives, where we can really, you know, get great quality content in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and you, uh, as part of the Yamiko approach, um, you showed us a chart of, you know, you start out with an app, you really start on the digital, and the TV series is maybe the, the third step yeah. down the road, which is, uh, I guess, also a more non-traditional model in those. In yeah, today. I think that, you know, we have been in the business for a long time, the four of us, um, and we really just felt like we know what we want to make, we know how to make it, um, we have the ability to make it, and so to do it on our own without having to go through the gatekeepers of uh, networks or studios um, is possible. So we're doing it. I mean, clearly we need distribution. That's like, that's the key for all of this and figuring out how to get that. And by having television, um, you have, you know, obviously a massive opportunity for a lot of eyeballs. When it comes to um, the marketing around digital properties, is there anything that, uh, let's say, film producers or distributors can learn uh, from the digital market? You know, I don't know. There's no secret sauce no. that I know of. Um, even like the most incredible marketing people that I've met with, um, everybody says it. It, it. You just you don't know. I mean, who knew that the Minerki was going to take off? I mean, you just you just don't know what's going to tap into the zeitgeist. What's going to get people excited? Um, but it's important to tap into it and to try to tap into it and to do it with social media. I think people like to become aware of things through social media. So in a sense, the way that marketing dollars were spent in the past um, it has changed, obviously. And the, where people, where studios advertise, where the way that people advertise is different. Um, but it's tricky because when you advertise on social media, a lot of us don't like to see the ads. <laughs> Yeah, um, and moving uh, for both, I think, Film Aid International and Yamiko, uh, education and empowerment seem to be very central to uh, those the mandates for both organizations and companies. Um, have you thought or are you thinking about using some of the technology and knowledge that you're now kind of gathering through Yamiko and using it towards something, an organi organization like Film Aid? Well, definitely. I mean, I, I feel like Film Aid is and should be using whatever new technology can be is available because i mean it's it's really amazing a friend of mine just got back from the amazon and she was um living with a group of people that don't wear clothes and they all had cell phones <laughs> strapped around their waist with like a string and nothing else um so i feel like it, it which is it, it's, it obviously brings up so many different, you know, thoughts. Um, but um, the uh, the fact that that the world is so connected is is kind of remarkable. And I think that having the, I mean, having from my own experiences, having been in a lot of refugee camps, um, in a lot of places where there was no access to um, to media, you know, I, I think it's an amazing thing to be able to now communicate with mobile. Um, and that we we should be doing it if we can. Mm, yeah, um, it's funny. Uh, the well, our mandate, TIFF's mandate, is actually transforming the way people see the world through film. We may, should maybe do make a slash on media, make it now media as well, because uh, digital media have become such a big part of what we are doing as well now as through the digi play space. Um, if you haven't been in the DigiPlay space yet, I recommend definitely check it out over the next few days. We also have a 3D printer in there, and uh, the maker movement is a fascinating movement to be to get involved in as well. Um, so kudos on you guys for working and partnering with Asher wants with you them. to know that we now have a 3D printer. Oh, wow. It was part of, if, if the Minerki made any money, <laughs> Asher wanted a 3D printer, but what he also wanted, both boys wanted to do, was give away a percentage of whatever money was earned to charity, and they've given away $13,000 to nonprofits. Well done, well done. Um, final call for questions. They're so shy. Nobody today. has a question? This is crazy. Go on. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Can I? Oh, sure. Um, maybe this is... Just from the boy's perspective, just what it's like to have a parent who's involved in, in uh, media. Any advice to another parent um, who's trying to get their kids, um, provide good boundaries, um, but play space to work in digital media. Um, what, what's your advice for parents? Well, we have a, um, a chart on our refrigerator 
that says, what does it say? Things, things to do before I even think of asking mommy and daddy. I don't for look at that. Do you want to say anything, guys? Um. <laughs> Well, it's, my husband, well, Anthony, just stand up for a second, is my, a, my partner in everything I do, movies and um, Yummy Co. and obviously child rearing. Um, and uh, very, very creative. And he and the kids have a lot of, um, share a lot in terms of, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I just want to say that although some people may think that like technology isn't that good for you, I think kids should still be allowed some time on it. Well, I think we think technology actually, in moderation, like everything else, um, is very good for you and very, very stimulating. Actually, as I came out, um, as I got, I went through security this morning on the plane, on the airport. Um, the the security person saw the kids with their devices. And he said, oh, that is so great that you that your kids are interested in computers. I said, that's so interesting. I'm talking about the power of media today. He said, no, I think it's fantastic. It really stimulates curiosity and creativity. Yeah. Uh, well, and uh, one of your uh, apps as well is actually engaging directly with that issue of you know, the balance between using media, but then also putting the device away and playing outside, but it's it's not all bad or all not all good. So it's, it needs to be a balance. Yeah. yeah. And it's here it's here to stay. Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. Any other questions? Do you have a question? Go ahead. <laughs> Why doesn't everybody have any questions is the question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um in financing the shows that you're now developing, are you feeling any kind of pressure? Because, by the way, the work that you do in, in film made that is unbelievable. I, I just I aspire to even think about thinking about it. <laughs> um, do you feel pressure? You know, you mentioned merchandising. I mean, just children's television. It's it's so much uh, something that comes up early on. And how much are you finding that that drives the creative? And do you feel it's um, like, you know, given all the other work that you're doing, how do you feel about that? It's a good question. I, I, oh, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> There's so many people now that say, good question. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so I think that it is, the children's media is really challenging, um, more challenging than I thought it was going to be. And for many reasons, um, one is, you know, obviously you've got very young minds that you're, um, addressing, and it's hard to raise money. Um, the distribution is definitely different from um, the adult world. Um, in terms of you know, the pressure, the merchandising, we, we definitely are open now to sponsorships, um, to working with brands that are aligned with ours. Um, you know, one thing I learned about when I started a nonprofit, was you know the, the sort of the difference between for-profit and nonprofit. And I feel like there absolutely should be for-profit companies should be allowed to make a profit, and and that you know it's okay if you know if there was one moment we had Pepsi was maybe interested in working on it, something we were doing. We were like, oh my god, Pepsi, we can't work with Pepsi because of the um, it's so unhealthy, and we're working about healthy, making healthy content, and and then we started thinking, well, but if Pepsi wants to make invest in healthy content, that's really a good thing. They have a really wide reach, so maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe, maybe that through this we can really create a movement where we actually are changing behavior and changing Pepsi's behavior in some way. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's definitely, um, you know, it's a challenge to raise money and it's, it's, I think, important to figure out ways to partner with other companies. Yeah. Um, we're actually also out of time, but before we close, so where can you buy, buy the Minerki? Is it still on sale on the website? The Minerki is still on sale um, at Minerki.com. Asher, you want to say something? <laughs> and Asher has um, just won a 
um, he's going to be given a Disruptive Innovation Award at the Tribeca Film Festival next week. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Okay. Anthony? No? You're good? Well, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Um, what a wonderful day, and thanks so much. <laughs>